talking to you tonight about car crashes. Where do they happen? When do they happen? Who's involved in the car crashes? And what can you do to prevent being involved in a crash? Corey's here. Corey is the moderator, does an excellent job of getting up videos I suggest you have a look at for more details. And he is in wintry Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada here. Elevator fan tuning in from Monticello, Indiana. And my good friend Mallory is tuning in from the Maritimes, the east coast of Canada here. If you're just tuning in, let us know where you're tuning in from and what class of license you're going, what we can help you with. We can help you with everything from motorcycles all the way up to tractor trailers, air brakes, log books, and everything in between, and trailering as well. We can help you with that. So that's what we do here. Marion is here. Hello, Marion. How are you? Awesome, awesome. A few people here already. And as I said, we're talking about car crashes. And the number one thing that you can do to significantly reduce your chances of being involved in a crash is have more space in front of your vehicle. Stay out of the clusters, especially out on the highways at higher speeds. That is what is going to keep you safe as well. When you stop in traffic at a traffic light or a stop sign or those types of things, stop back one vehicle length from the vehicle in front of you. Everything in social driving, and for those of you who haven't been on the channel before, social driving is how people drive after they get their license. They speed, they follow too close, they stop too close in traffic, and don't stop completely at stop signed intersections. They do all the things that are dangerous and are eventually going to result in a crash. So more space in front. If I can tell you one thing, it's very simple, but it's hard to implement because everything in the driving environment is telling you to do something else. Bridget is here watching from, oh, it's hidden. I've got a, <laughs> there's a heart in the corner down in the comments there and it's hiding something. So anyway, I'll see it here once it moves up. Uh, tuning in, uh, no left lane squatters today. Awesome, that's great to hear. Elevator fan, yes, that is part and parcel of driving. Left lane squatters. Uh, people that police you and tell you that you are doing something wrong in no uncertain terms. The way that other drivers communicate, you they follow too close. For example, tailgating you, telling you're going too slow. And then you, or somebody else, in the front slows down 10 miles an hour to tell the person behind them that they're tailgating them. So it's it's not a win-win situation at all. It's uh, less than ideal for sure. Uh, Mallory, it's cold here and it's winter time in the Maritimes. Yes, my son flew to Ontario to spend a week with his grandma. Uh, my kids, when they turned 12, both got a trip, a solo trip to Ontario from here. So they got to go by themselves. So that was very exciting for him. and. It's snowing and sledding and those types of things, and that's what he wanted to do, so really great. Uh, retired, hello my friend, how are you? Awesome, awesome. So a few people here, uh, we'll get over to the presentation, we'll get through the presentation. Uh, presentation lasts 10 or 12 minutes, and then I'll come back and I'll answer all your questions about uh, passing a driver's test and starting a, uh, being a safer, smarter driver. All right. Uh, car crashes, we're talking about buying cars that are going to keep you safe and implementing maneuvers and skills and habits that are also going to significantly reduce your chances of being involved in a crash. And if you're purchasing a vehicle and safety is a consideration, there is so much great information on the internet, uh, safety ratings for vehicles, different kinds of crashes, those types of things, all of that is going to be valuable in doing some research before you go out and purchase a vehicle. Retired says it's 54 degrees in North Carolina, which is respectable. It's not great. <laughs> and Ant, tuning in from the UK. Hello, uh, Ray is here. Day is going awesome. Thank you for all the tips and tricks. You are most welcome, my friend. Thank you for tuning in and being part of the Smarter Driver community. And get my controls here. There we go. All right, for those of you new to Smart Drive Test, my name is Rick August. I was a truck driver in the 1990s between Ontario, Canada and the lower 48. While I was going to university in Australia, I drove buses for Greyhound in one of the regional bus lines there. Became a licensed commercial driving instructor in 1997. Uh, since that time, uh, I've started the online YouTube channel. I've written a couple of books, uh, e-books. Uh, Corey will put the links up for those. The air brakes explained simply as well as driving test secrets, which is available on Amazon. You can download, I think it's about $10. 
uh, for the driving test secrets and gives you everything you need to be successful on passing your driver's test first time. All right, uh, 2006, graduated from the University of Melbourne uh, with my doctorate in legal history, and it is hard to believe that it is that long ago. <laughs> okay, and it's hard to believe but I'm on YouTube since 2015. Uh, that's eight years now. Uh, I was reading something the other day on Twitter that was saying uh, most YouTubers are three to five years uh, is a lifespan for a YouTuber. So I guess I'm doing well. I'm one of the old timers here on YouTube then, I guess. So, uh, smart stuff to look at, a uh, new video last week, uh, top 14 winter driving tips. I put up uh, great information for you driving in the winter. We had a good, really good dump of snow here a couple of weeks ago and went out and reshot the winter driving video and some really good tips in there. First and foremost, make sure you have good quality tires on your vehicle. And I'm not talking about winter specific rated tires. I'm talking about uh, tires that are rated with the mountain snowflake symbol or the m and mud and snow rating on the tires and they have good quality tread on them that is going to give you the best traction in the winter time good windshield washer our windshield wipers and make sure that you have your washer fluid typed up as well uh, Corey's put up the link there for air brakes explained simply have a look at that and five defensive driving strategies uh, to implement and this will talk to you more about space management and managing space in front of your vehicle all right, crashes. I wrote an article some years ago, an academic article that was published in a book uh, called um, Traffic, oddly enough, and Spinning Our Wheels, which is essentially saying that policy, law, and other social media programs have not influenced driver's behavior. We still drive as badly as we did 100 years ago. <laughs> And uh, traffic injuries, traffic crashes, the number of those has not gone down. We have reduced the number of traffic fatalities, but we have not reduced the number of traffic crashes and we have not reduced the number of injuries that happen on our roadways every year. All right, in the early 1900s, before the turn of the, 19th, uh, the 20th century, uh, we're now living in the 21st century, so the beginning of the 20th century in the 1900s, war, famine, and disease were the number one killers of people on roadways. Today, that those top three killers of human beings are terminal illness, suicide, and traffic crashes. And as I said, it's easy to quantify, to tell how many people were killed in car crashes, maiming and injuring. A lot of crashes go unreported or are reported poorly or they don't get to the agencies and organizations that do the crunching of numbers. So that's not as easy. If we took all of the traffic crashes that happened in one country in one year and were put in one place at one time, no doubt it would be considered a national emergency in terms of car crashes. However, we don't seem to really take notice of car crashes. Uh, here's an example of what, what I mean in terms of the psychology of driving. If you were injured on a motorcycle, it would be unlikely that when you got out of the hospital that you would climb back on a motorcycle and you would ride home on a motorcycle. It's most likely that you would get in a car. If you were injured in a car and went to the hospital and convalesced for a few months and then got out of the hospital, the first thing you would do is get in a car and drive home. So the difference in those things uh, talks to the psychology of driving and crashes. Nobody is immune to traffic crashes. James Dean was killed in 1955. He was most famous for the movie Rebel Without a Cause. Uh, here in Canada, people will know Tim Hortons for the Tim Hortons Coffee Shop. He was a hockey player as well. Uh, he was killed in a car crash in 1974. We all know Princess Diana. She was uh, Will and Hen Harry's mom. Uh, she was killed in a car crash in 1997, and Paul Walker of the franchise, with a touch of irony, The Fast and the Furious, was killed in 2013. So nobody is immune of traffic crashes. And the picture here, actually, interesting enough, is a speeding ticket that James Dean received two hours before he died in a traffic crash. So a little bit of trivia history for you there. All right. Most crashes, contrary to what most people believe, which is that they're going to die in the winter time driving on roadways, uh, and people are more fearful of driving on snow and ice in the winter time than they are of driving in hurricanes, tornadoes, or forest fires, which was uh, one of the polls I put up here on the YouTube channel on the community tab. 
Contrary to what most people think, most traffic crashes happen on, in, during clear weather, dry roads, the driver is sober, uh, lots of single vehicle crashes, and people are inebriated because of single vehicle collisions, fatigue, prescription medications, and over the, or prescription medications and over-the-counter drugs. That's how people are inebriated and that's how people crash. It's not what they think. <laughs> it's unlikely that you're going to have a crash in the wintertime. Types of crashes, head-on crashes, T-bone crashes, these two are mostly fatal. Uh, in high-income countries such as Canada, Australia, Europe, and the United States, uh, head-on crashes have been more or less controlled with road infrastructure. T-bone crashes, on the other hand, are a product of left-hand turns for the most part, and they're often fatal because all of the energy is focused on one part of the body and it, there's very little in the doors or the side of the car that is actually going to protect you. Uh, rear end crashes are the most common crashes in the United States and this is why I preach and talk about and tell you again and again and again, manage space in front of your vehicle to keep yourself safe. Stop back one vehicle length. You can manage that space in front of your vehicle. Space gives you time. Time gives you options. Options prevent crashes. And then, of course, the the one that only res that mo most often results in property damage, just damage to the vehicles and other property, are side swipe crashes. If you have a choice between these other three, a head-on crash, a T-bone crash, and a rear-end crash, pick the side swipe crash every time if you have a choice because you're the chances are very high that you're going to survive a side swipe crash. Rural crashes, crashes that happen on country roads and back gravel, forest roads and in the in on farmlands and those types of things, these are where most fatalities happen is on two-lane highways and whatnot. Part of the issue, problems with these types of crashes is somebody finding you first and foremost because you're in the middle of nowhere. Emergency service is getting to you. It is getting better with GPS and cell phones and with helicopters and uh, medevacs and those types of things. But many of these are single vehicle crashes. Oftentimes the driver is inebriated, uh, driving too fast on gravel roads and those types of things and crash into a tree. And unfortunately it takes somebody some time to find them. So they end up lying there uh, without assistance for a very long period of time. So fatal crashes often occur in rural settings. Okay, top three reasons for crashes, failing to yield, failing to give the right of way, the right of way myth, which I will talk about after uh, the presentation here, following too close, following too close, following too close. I will say it again and again and again. And you can see the two cars here. There's a completely open road here. <laughs> and there's two cars right beside each other and another one hanging out right beside them. Uh, there's so much road there. Go somewhere else, okay? Mismanagement of speed and space. And then of course, speeding, every authority, will preach till the cows come home that speed is the culprit and causes crashes. No, it is the, one of the least contributing factors. And unfortunately, we're in we hate, the, we hate cars phase right now where they are reducing residential speeds everywhere to 20 miles an hour, 15 kilometers an hour, whatever. And they think that they are going to reduce uh, vulnerable crashes with vulnerable road users. The problem is education. We are not educating drivers that at intersections is where they're going to cross paths with vulnerable road users and that they need to be more careful at these locations. All right, intoxicated late 1960s. We'll go just go back in history a little bit and it's hard to believe that the late 1960s was 60 years ago. <laughs> just crazy to think that. Uh, drinking, driving, dating, and distracted driving are the four D's that young people are dealing with. They having new experiences with every one of these all at the same time because the GLP program, the GDL, as I've talked to you before, has not significantly reduced crashes amongst young people. It's simply postponed when young people are getting their license. They're not getting their license till they're 18, 19, 20 years old now. And the problem with that is, is that now they've pushed the driving age up close to the drinking age and they're getting experience with driving and drinking at the same time. 
Now we have distractions with cell phones and everything else that's in these cars with these big telematic uh, screens in the middle, uh, phones, and then of course dating and all of that stuff. So maybe by the time they get to 20, they've had most of the dating, uh, you know, euphoria out of their system so they can deal with those other things. Uh, drink driving laws are changing. We're increasing police powers. Uh, I'll tell you a funny story about that that Phil told me the other day. He's a police officer that I train at jujitsu with. And if you have teenagers and they are going out and they are drinking, sign Mads contract for life. I cannot emphasize the value of this tool. It's simply an agreement between you and your kids, your kids and your parents, the kids, if it is young people who are watching and listening to me, uh, you and your parents saying that no matter where you are, if you're inebriated and you need a ride home, I'll come and get you at whatever time it is. No questions asked. I'm not going to penalize you. I'm not, you're not going to get into trouble. Just call me and I will come and get you. And it works both ways for both parties. So look down in the description. The uh, MADS contract for life is down there. Definitely use that. Okay. Some of the safety features on vehicles that have evolved over the 20th and 21st century, uh, crumple zones, particularly in the front, uh, and this is why we have reduced fatalities related to head-on crashes, uh, safety glass, breakaway steering columns, uh, safety restraints, uh, breakaway steering columns, and uh, smaller knobs and dials in the inside the cabin of the ve or inside the cabin of the automobile came about because of unsafe at any speed with uh, Ralph Nader. And some people will say, oh, Ralph Nader was full of baloney and nothing was substantiated in what he said and those types of things. It doesn't matter if Ralph Nader wasn't substantiated and there's false claims. What is important in terms of the book, Unsafe at Any Speed, was the safety movement that Ralph Nader initiated amongst auto manufacturers because prior to unsafe at any speed, Ralph or unsafe at any speed, auto manufacturers were of the opinion that safety would not sell. And it was actually <laughs> Volvo that capitalized on this and became uh, the marketer for the safest car on the roadways. So if you want to buy a safe car, it's probably going to be the Volvo that's going to have all of these safety features in them. And then, of course, in the late 80s, early 1990s, on high-end cars, we had airbags. And now we have side impact airbags. All of this reducing traffic crashes or traffic fatalities when a crash occurs. Okay, medical advances have been significant, a significant contributor to reducing traffic deaths. Uh, medical advances have kept people alive. Uh, the golden hour, we now, know, know, we now know about trauma victims and that if we can get them into surgery within the hour, most of the time they are going to survive and live and they have a better quality of life afterwards. However, there could be an argument put forth for what kind of quality of life do they have? Are they in pain for the rest of their life or not? Are they needing physiotherapy and all kinds of other treatments to continue to have some sort of life after a traffic crash? Okay, most of these medical advances that we enjoy today came out of the Vietnam War, but of course it's been a long time. It's been 50 years since the Vietnam War, but there were a lot of medical advances that come out of there. And of course, we've continued to build with medical science and technology. And remember, pick the best answer, not necessarily the right answer. Head back over here. Corey's put up all those resources for you. Thank you for that. Have a look at those if you can. Uh, Corey, thank you for doing all of that. Uh, Mallory says it's minus six outside with a wind chill. It feels like minus 11. I always find that interesting. We have a wind chill now. We don't really know how cold it is. <laughs> it's just like, it should feel like this. No, it's just cold. It's just cold outside. Put a coat on. Uh, Ray, uh, day is going well. Yes. Awesome. Great. And, uh, retired in North California, uh, North Carolina, rather. I said California. I know that. <laughs> and I know that retired is in North Carolina. I was wondering what he was doing in North, Ca North California. I was like, North California, what's he doing in North California? Uh, but you did say something about your RV or getting new tires. I remember that we had a discussion about that a couple of weeks ago. So yeah, really great. All right. So car crashes. So I'll tell you a funny story. We uh, have increased uh, police powers in terms of drinking and driving here in British Columbia. And I, it's unfortunate that Tim isn't here because he could talk about that. 
about increased police powers in terms of roadside prohibitions that police are now they now have that uh, power here in the province of British Columbia. Uh, stupid question: How do you tell when the winter tires need changing? Uh, Marion, I'm going to try and give you three millimeters of tread. I just double check that number, but it's three millimeters of, of tread. Um, okay, uh, let me clarify the question first, Marion. When winter tires need changing? Okay, so winter tires to summer tires or when your winter tires are worn out and need to be replaced? Which one of those is that, the question? And then I can answer it correctly, okay? All right, so Phil was telling me the story about pulling somebody over during the week uh, and usually he's got his places where he sits in town and he gets this person for not wearing a seatbelt. And so they go by, they're not wearing a seatbelt, he takes note, they go into a bottle shop here, like a liquor store. It's like we have government liquor stores here and we have privately owned ones. So it was a privately owned one. So the person goes in, comes back out, pulls him over, and he's like, something's not right. And he's, so he's, he administers a breathalyzer. And the first breathalyzer gives him an air code that he's, he's never seen before. So he's got two breathalyzer machines in his cruiser. So he goes and gets the other breathalyzer machine and he comes back and it blows a 25, which is like off the chart. <laughs> and the only way that this breathalyzer can blow this number is if there's alcohol in the mouth. So in other words, they came out of the liquor store Op cracked open whatever booze they had, took a swig of the booze, and then put it down and there was open booze in the car. But he couldn't see any open booze in the car. So he calls another police officer. The other police officer comes and brings yet a third machine because the first machine that he had gave a weird reading. And so he's talking to the woman in the car and he's asking her about whether she'd been drinking and she's like, no, no, I haven't been drinking. And there's obviously there's no open alcohol in the car or those types of things. And so the other officer comes, administers the test. Again, they get another weird reading on the machine. And <laughs> he's, he said, you know, they're having a discussion and she's like, she finally says to him, she says, well, what about hairspray? Would hairspray set the machine off? And he goes, well, what do you mean? And she says, well, I was using this hairspray. And so they read the con contents of the hairspray and there's alcohol in the hairspray. And what she was doing, as she admitted to the officers, was that she was taking the hairspray and she liked the fizzy feeling of it when she sprayed it in her mouth. <laughs> so she had come out of the liquor store with booze in the car, got in the car, and she took this hairspray and she goes, in her mouth, ah! And then gets goes over, gets pulled over for not having a seatbelt on. And she blows in the breathalyzer and they're like, oh, there's alcohol in the thing and it's messing with the breathalyzer. So <laughs> could you imagine being that woman sitting on the side of the road thinking she's just getting pulled over for a speeding ticket and she's getting pulled or pulled over for a seatbelt ticket rather. And then the... <laughs> And she's paranoid that they're gonna they're gonna take her license away because they can do that. They have police powers here to do that in the province. And then it turns out that she's like inhaling hairspray. And she said, you know, I talked to my boyfriend about it, and he thought it was kind of weird. Do you think that's kind of weird? And my friend Phil, who's a police officer, was like, yeah, that's weird. <laughs> so anyway, uh, yeah, the weird things that people do. So you know, if you're inhaling or ingesting or spraying weird things in your mouth just check to see if the ingredients list on whatever it is you're doing uh doesn't have alcohol in it so that's that story about getting pulled over and roadside prohibitions and those types of things so they can issue you for blowing over on a uh, breathalyzer they can uh, issue you a 24-hour prohibition uh, seven days and then I think it's 30 days like I said if Tim was here he'd be able to tell these these numbers better than I can but they can automatically 
take your license away and have your vehicle impounded uh, if you blow over on a breathalyzer test in the province of British Columbia. And it is a severe charge. If you get a drink driving charge and you lose your license, uh, which happens a lot more than we would like to think, unfortunately, the grassroots campaigns from MAD and SAD and all the other organizations about you know anti-drink driving campaigns, these are not working. We still have a lot of people who are drinking and driving on our roadways. And <clears throat> when the snow melts here in the spring, just go out and walk along the roadway, any highway or whatnot, and find out, look in the ditches and see how many bottles and cans are in the ditches being thrown out of people's vehicles. So Marion, uh, sorry, when the win winter tires need replacing, yes, of course, put up the numbers for you there. Uh, winter tires, 430 sec seconds of an inch, it's about three millimeters on the tread. And basically what you do, for those of you who want to know if your tires are worn is to go to a, a tire shop okay and have them inspect your tires and have them tell you whether the tires need to be replaced or not <clears throat> now it's the other piece about that in terms of knowing whether your tires are worn and they need to re be replaced it's not just four thirty seconds of an inch it's whether the tires are unevenly worn because if you haven't had a wheel alignment on your vehicle in some time, uh, sometimes they will wear on the inside because they're um, it's out of alignment. So the, the tire, instead of riding like this, is riding like this. So all of the weight is on the inside edge of that tire and it will prematurely wear. And, <clears throat> excuse me. If that happens, you have to get the tire replaced. So the only way that you can tell that is if you take it in tire shop, get somebody who does this all the time. Uh, they'll look at the tires, they'll jack it up, they'll spin the tires around, have a look at them, those types of things. So it is always a good idea if you are not handy and don't know how to take your tires off and those types of things. Because on the buggy, I've got a floor jack and all the tools I need to swap my tires out and then I inspect the tire uh, when I stack it up for the winter time in the garage. Also, I will take it into a tire shop, Cal Tire, uh, Tireland or whatever tire shop that you're using and get them to inspect your tires as well. And I suggest to you, if you get new tires on your vehicle, spend the $100 and get a wheel alignment on your vehicle. That will prolong <laughs> the life of your tires. I unfortunately did not do that one time. I got a new set of tires for the vehicle. The tires only lasted 50,000 kilometers, which is like 30,000 miles. And the tires were completely done because the vehicle required a wheel alignment. And so get a wheel alignment. The other thing is, is if you do take your vehicle in for a wheel alignment, you're getting the tires changed out. <clears throat> Make sure that you have a full tank of fuel when you take it in. Uh, something to do with the weight distribution in the vehicle and those types of things. But that's what you need to do if you're going to get new tires on your vehicle. So car crashes, the ways that you significantly reduce your chances of being involved in a crash, the smarter defensive driving model, okay? Social driving, as I talked to you about, it's the way that people drive after they get their license. They follow too close. They stop too close in traffic. They don't come to complete stop, stop signed intersections. They speed, those types of things. Manage that space in front of your vehicle because if you're not near anything, it's less likely that you're going to hit anything. Okay, speed management. Okay, manage speed, control your speed so that you can have that space because space buys you time, time buys you options, options prevent crashes. Communication, communicate effectively with other traffic, observe and communicate. Those two things work in tandem, they dovetail together. Okay. Because we're looking around, we are observing other traffic and whatnot, but we need to communicate effectively to what we're doing with other traffic. Communicating is our backup to our observation. So do that. So the ways that we observe, forward scanning pattern far down the road, in check your center mirror far down the road, in check your instrument panel far down the road, left wing mirror far down the road, right wing mirror. That's your forward scanning pattern. When you're turning, shoulder checking, mirror signal shoulder check. As you're coming up half a block from there, and we need to shoulder check right and left depending on which way you're turning, okay? Always, always shoulder check, always, always signal that. Form that habit 
so that you do it automatically when you're driving. You don't even have to think about it, okay? There's too many people who are making driving too complicated. Oh, you don't have to signal in parking lots. You don't have to shoulder check on a left-hand turn. Rubbish, because one day it's going to catch up to you and one day it's going to get you into trouble and, and see you uh, being involved in a crash and you don't want that to happen. Uh, one crash I worked on years ago, the driver came up, made a left-hand turn, obviously was participating in social driving, as well, not only were they making a left turn at the intersection, they were also preparing to drift over into the right lane after making the turn because as they moved through the intersection, they shoulder checked to the right. <laughs> Unfortunately, what had happened just as they came into the intersection, somebody, a pedestrian had preempted the light on this side and made it to the center lane. The vehicle turned. Obviously, the vehicle, the pedestrian didn't hear the, the vehicle or see the signal stepped out into the lane and the pickup truck drove into the pedestrian on the cross street. So shoulder check left, shoulder check left. All he had to do was shoulder check left. Unfortunately, the driver was participating in social driving and shoulder check right in anticipation of moving and changing lanes to the right lane and didn't see the pedestrian to the left that had preempted the light and got to the center point of the lane of the two lanes of traffic before stepping out into the left, the path of the left turning vehicle. Marion, uh, don't they automatically do a wheel alignment when they change the tires? Uh, Marion, no, they don't. They, a lot, they um, rotate, not rotate your tires. What's it called? <laughs> uh, tire rotation. What's it called? <laughs> I'm having a brain cramp. And when they take your tire off, and they put it on that machine and they spin it to balance it. They balance your tires. That's what I'm looking for. It, just, it took me a little bit to get there, but they balance the tires. They don't do a wheel alignment automatically when they change the tires on your vehicle. Uh, Marion, no, they don't. You have to pay extra for that and you have to tell them to do it. So if you're changing the tires, you're getting new tires on your vehicle, tell them that you want a wheel alignment done in your vehicle. They do balance the tires, but that's not a wheel alignment. Wheel alignment is different. That's on your car. Okay. <laughs> Marion says, I know what you mean. And I'm like, yeah, but does everybody else know? Okay. So wheel balance, they balance the tires. Tire balancing is different from a wheel alignment. Okay. Tire balancing is, is they put the tire on a machine and then they spin it and they make sure that it doesn't wobble. They put weights on it. They, you see little lead weights around the rim every now and again. That's to balance the tire when it's spinning. A wheel alignment is making sure that your vehicle, the tires are all positioned on your vehicle. So there's uh, toe this way. The tires sit this way a certain way. Uh, camber. No, that's caster this way. And then there's camber. What's camber? But anyway, the tires can sit this way, sit this way, sit this way, sit this way, sit this way. Uh, and all of that is according to the vehicle manufacturers. And it, they put it on a machine and they do that uh, wheel alignment. And so it gets out of alignment because we go over bumps and bangs and we turn and those types of things. And all of that causes the vehicle to go out of wheel alignment. So do that when you change the tires and it will prolong the life of your vehicle or prolong the life of your new tires, for example. Uh, Mallory, I like to shoulder check uh, from the passenger seat just for the fun of it. Awesome, that's great. And yes, excellent. All right, blessed, how are you, my friend? Aloha, my friend. Uh, and uh, watching dash cam footage on YouTube thinking the driver with the camera could have done more to avoid the crash. Yes, that's the other thing that I wanted to talk to you about. Thank you for that, Ant. Uh, dash cams. Do I get a dash cam to prove that the other person was wrong? <laughs> oh, and accidentally hit curbs too. Yes, that will put it out of alignment as well. Absolutely, Marion. All right, so dash cams. Lots of people believe that they should get a dash cam. And there was a post, I can't call it a tweet anymore, it's a post on X, formerly known as Twitter. That, that didn't work out for him, did it? It's kind of like the artist formerly known as Prince. The social media platform for, formerly known as Twitter. Uh, cracks me up every time. Uh, anyway, there was a post and the truck driver's like, oh, I wasn't at fault. Dash cam proved the, the young woman was inexperienced, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, okay, 
So the first problem with dash cams, it's me against you, social driving. I'm perfect and I'm going to get you and I'm going to prove that you're wrong. That's the first thing that's wrong with dash cams because as I've told you, it's a social activity. Driving is a social activity. It's social driving. And it's exactly what Ant just said. Somebody else could have done something more to avoid the crash, which is exactly right. I run a dash cam in my car all the time because I have it for recording shorts and helping you and educating you and those types of things, right? I have watched <laughs> myself with my dash cam when I'm going through my dash cam footage blowing red lights okay i've seen myself do it i get up to the light the thing the link the, the lights turning yellow and i charge the light and i am participating in social driving and i run the red light i see myself do things that a lot of times i think if that resulted in a crash i would be at fault so know that dash cams are a double-edged sword they're not only going to prove that you didn't do anything wrong and the other person was at fault that's not true <laughs> that's not always true it could work against you as well uh, crash analysis as many of you do uh, know some of the work that I do as a consultant I do crash analysis and for personal injury lawyers and personal injury lawyers get involved uh, number of the cases that I've worked on involve transit buses all transit buses now have minimum four cameras on them uh, inside the bus outside the bus and in the front of the bus in almost every case that I've worked on uh, against the, the transit authority being the defendant, uh, I have been employed to work for the plaintiff. And when I have worked for the plaintiff, the cameras from the bus have been used to prove that the transit driver was negligent in his or her duty in almost every case. So, the dash cams are not serving the transit authority well at all. <laughs> okay. Uh, and it's the same thing with security cameras. And it's the other piece about this uh, in terms of dash cams. If something happens, assume that you are on camera, especially if you are in an urban area. Uh, another case that I worked on uh, in involved a, a cement truck working in a residential area the truck rolled away and they had two separate videos of the event from doorbell cameras doorbell cameras so assume that you are on camera just about everywhere you're going dash cams security footage uh, doorbell cameras uh, uh, security cameras uh, along major thoroughfares in large metropolitan areas and those types of things so know that that yes Maybe, perhaps, a dash cam is a good thing, right? Uh, somebody breaks into your vehicle. The problem with dash cams, I will tell you, is that the quality of the dash cam is not very good. And as one video that I was watching today, a tech channel, where they're talking about dash cams and the quality of the dash cams, usually the only time that a dash cam, will, you can read a license plate on a vehicle is if both vehicles are stopped. If your vehicle is stopped and the vehicle that you're photographing is also stopped. That's the only time you can pick up a license plate number. Most of the time you can't. Uh, Tim, what's the quality of the video on your uh, dash cams? Because on my dash cam, I have a high-end Garmin in my vehicle. The quality is not very good. If I'm stopped and the other vehicle is stopped, then yes, I can pick up a license plate, but otherwise I cannot pick up a license plate. Uh, I recently ordered a dash cam that claimed it was 4k it's not 4k and actually i put it back in the bag and left it on the floor here sitting beside my desk because i didn't get back <laughs> i didn't get it back within the month because i'd ordered it just before i went to australia so know that dash cams are not going to serve you well in every situation all right <laughs> uh corey i was thinking about that before i wondered if those cameras were meant to protect the bus and transit but it could easily prove the opposite as you've described and yes, Corey, it, it does not work well for them. But there are incidents, obviously, uh, if they have passengers on the vehicle, those types of things that are doing something illegal or something that would uh, 
jeopardize the safety of other passengers on the vehicle, then I'm sure they work well. But for the most part, uh, it doesn't, they don't work, <laughs> they don't work in the favor of the transit. Uh, Tim says, that's why I need plates to uh, read my camera. I'll read plates to my camera. Okay. <laughs> okay. There, yeah, and that's something else you can do. Uh, if you have the audio recording on your dash cam, you can leave notes for yourself. A lot of times I will have to leave notes for myself because I'll go back and a lot of the traffic incidents that I'm recording happen so quickly uh, that when I go back and try and look at it, sometimes I'll miss it. So I'll have to leave myself an audio note. So you're sitting in the car, you know, talking to your camera to leave yourself audio notes and those types of things are reading license plates, as Tim said, because the quality is not that good. Uh, okay, so Marizone, thank you for the super chat. That is awesome, my friend, and social driving. So driving is a social activity. We all have to get along according to set of rules, right-of-way rules, those types of things. Social driving is the way that people drive after they get their license. They tailgate, they follow too close, they stop too close in traffic, they speed, they don't come to complete stops at stop sign intersections. As we said, dash cams, it's us, it's me against all the other crazy people out there on the roadway. And not only that, but people are there on the roadway and they think that they're the best driver ever because they think and believe uh, to the point where they're policing other drivers, they're policing other drive or other road users rather, pedestrians and people on the cyclists and those types of things and telling yo you're an idiot oh you did that wrong you you don't know how to drive ah what's a signal for those types of things all of that is social driving and all of that is what causes traffic crashes as well and part and parcel of social driving is the right of way myth i have the right of way and i will tell you right now is the larger the vehicle you're driving, the less right of way you have, the more you should be giving up the right of way to other people to prevent crashes. And going back to what Ant was saying again, in terms of watching dash cam footage here on YouTube and other places on the internet, is that you think to yourself, there probably could have been more that they, there, there was more that they could have done to prevent that crash, absolutely. So know that <laughs> there's always something you can do to prevent a crash. And the biggest thing you can do is have more space in front of your vehicle when you're driving. That is going to prevent crashes because if you're not near anything, it's less likely that you're going to hit something. Uh, Con, uh, good evening, Rick. I drive a shuttle bus in downtown Toronto and find it safer, as you said, I think to give way the right of way uh, than end up in a crash. Your tips have helped me and that is awesome, my friend. So happy to hear we can help out and all the best there. Uh, Tim says, my camera was a big help uh, when I backed. I was backed into in a parking lot. And yes, those types of incidents are going to help you out for sure. Uh, if you have a dash cam and whatnot, um, especially if you can get the license plate number uh, and whatnot. Um, me personally, when I'm in parking lots, I tend to park near the back or those drive through spaces. I always like going closer to the back and then that way I can drive through and drive out and I don't have to back out of the parking space. So, um, you know, I'm not saying don't get a dash cam. I'm not saying don't do that. I'm just saying that there's a negative side to dash cams, right? We're in love with technology right now. And as I said to my kids, you know, be careful what you post, be careful what you say when you're in public because there is a high probability more than 80% that you are on camera somewhere, somebody is videoing you. Uh, Dallas, how do I get over fear of driving? What would you suggest? Uh, Dallas, uh, are you having fear uh, in general or is there specific? Are you afraid of driving on highways or driving in the city or those types of things? Uh, Tim says, biggest error I see in YouTube driving videos is following too close and yes, and Crash stats would substantiate that, Tim, for sure, because the number one crash in North America is rear end crashes, uh, even more so uh, insurance related claim than windshield damage, which is incredible. So yeah, people following too close, just all the time. Uh, for those of you uh, 
living in the province of British Columbia, check out uh, DrySmart BC, Tim's website. Uh, great information over there. Lots of great uh, tips about traffic safety, road maintenance, uh, winter maintenance, um, engineering, traffic laws, court cases, anything to do with traffic safety as well. Uh, there's a forum over at his website to talk to other experts and engage in conversation and dialogue. dialogue. So check that out as well. Uh, Dallas has fear in general. Okay, so one of the things you need to do, Dallas, is you need obviously to get more experience, but that's tough when you have fear around driving. Uh, are you working with a driving instructor or are you working with a professional or anybody like that? Uh, if you have somebody who's a mentor uh, you, that you trust, as somebody who has some driving experience that you could go out with, and that would definitely help you out as well uh, to get some experience. Uh, work in low density areas that have uh, work in areas that have low density traffic. So in other words, they don't have a lot of traffic work in residential areas. Uh, those types of things go out earlier in the morning, go out later in the evening when there isn't as many cars on the roadway. The other piece, uh, Dallas, that I would suggest is working in a parking lot, doing backing up, uh, driving around in circles, parking into parking spaces, those types of things. Those slow speed maneuvers will really help you out as well to get confidence. Uh, if you have fear in general, I don't know how bad your fear is. Uh, sit, sitting in the vehicle and familiarizing yourself with the vehicle, that'll help out as well. Uh, just getting comfortable and, and repeating to yourself with a mantra that I am a good driver, I am driving well. Uh, if your fear is really bad, I might suggest you working with a psychologist or a psychiatrist or somebody that can help you out. But just more exposure, working with people that can help you out. And if you do get a driving instructor that you're working with, uh, try and find a driving instructor that has worked with senior citizens. They tend to be calmer, uh, have more empathy towards people that have fear and those types of things. Uh, and uh, you know, maybe if your fear stems from something else, uh, maybe you were involved in a car crash or something like that, uh, yeah, then you definitely need to work with some a professional and whatnot that can definitely help you get over that fear and whatnot. Uh, 172 in a week away from being fully recovered from the wreck I got into in November. I just have fear with driving now, especially going through intersections. Yeah, it's going to take a little bit. Uh, if you had a wreck in November and you've been convalescing since that time, you are going to have some fear and trepidation. I certainly know what you're talking about. Uh, I got run over my bicycle when I was in Australia and there were three months at least before I was not freaking out every time I got on my bicycle and started riding again and, and talking about that when I was talking about the psychology of driving during the presentation when I said you know if people get in, injured on a bicycle or they get injured on a motorcycle and they get them out of the hospital they don't get back on a motorcycle and they don't get back on a bicycle no but if they get injured in a car wreck they'll come out of the hospital and they get in a car and go home right so we have this psychology of driving about you know transportation is more important or is higher on the I don't know what you would call it but you know it overcomes our fear for sure but we wouldn't get back on a bicycle but let me tell you I did get back on a bicycle because I said to myself if I don't get back on a bicycle if I don't overcome this I'm not gonna ride again and I absolutely love riding my bicycle so I still still do and, but I'll tell you, there were three, four months there where I was still very, very anxious when I was on my bicycle. Uh, Allah. Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm living in Belgium and I have exam in three days. So I want to ask about when you are exiting a highway, how do you know that my exit is near? Okay. So Allah, one of the ways you know that your exit is near, first of all, get a holder for your phone and have your GPS on and your your GPS will tell you. Now, if you're going for your exam and the examiner is with you, the examiner should be giving you directions and saying at this next exit, we're gonna be getting off. Now, I, I don't know how the test is administered in Germany. I understand that it's pretty difficult and it's it's got a high bar. One of the things that you can do, as I said, get a phone holder for your phone, have your GPS on, and your GPS will give you directions. Now, I don't, I've never heard of a driving test that they do that, unless it's a commercial driver's test, but the examiner will give you plenty of notice uh, for directions and getting off the highway and those types of things. So know that uh, for your driver's test, and you'll be just fine. 
Uh, Rawson, love driving alone. I don't have any fear of driving. That is awesome, my friend. Uh, <laughs> Khaled, yes, uh, GoPro sports cameras. Uh, GoPros actually work really well. The problem with uh, GoPro sports cameras is they only record for about two hours, an hour maximum. No, what's, um, Ali, you can't use your phone. Okay, it's not GPS here. Okay, but you, um, Ali, you are with a driving instructor, so the driving instructor is going to give you directions about where you're going to get off and those types of things. Okay. Uh, the other thing is that, um, The, I'm trying to think of another way that you can do I mean, there is an exit number on the exit that you're going to be getting off at, and you can know the exit number, right? And then keep track of the exit number. So, for example, if you're getting off at exit 40, know that when you get to exit 39, the next exit is going to be 40, and you're going to start moving over, and you're going to get off on that freeway, okay? Uh, Epic, what can happen to you on the highways in the UK, Australia? Uh, you can be rear-ended, but also sideswiped in the case of sideswipe damage uh, where it passes. Yeah, the other thing with um, sideswipe crashes is that you have to be careful of losing control of the vehicle. If you do get sideswiped, make sure that you don't freak out and veer over, okay? So somebody comes into you and sideswipes you and you're like, oh my God, and you s whip the steering wheel, you have the potential of losing control of your vehicle and then the crash could be... 10 times is worse, right? And there is one of oversteering here on the channel on the in the crash analysis playlist uh, Coral put up for us and that's what happened. The vehicle comes out on the highway, sideswipes the car beside it, the car beside it loses control, freaks out, oversteers and then drives right into the concrete embutment. So, if you get sideswiped, <laughs> okay? Hang on to that steering wheel and keep the vehicle straight. And my friend Rob is right here. Hello, hello. Uh, driving by to say hello. Sorry I'm late. Uh, it's all good, my friend. Uh, awesome. Ala, you're going to do just fine. Good luck on your test there in Germany. And drop back and let us know how it goes, my friend. Uh, Marion, won't they have signs on the highway give you notice before the exit so you are aware of the uh, exit coming up? Yeah, that's what I was thinking too, Marion. I was thinking the same thing. Uh, Dad, if I use Atlantic... Cuss words, is it still road rage? I like to tell people to move their... <laughs> uh, yeah, that's that's probably still cursing, cussing other drivers and participating in social driving and whatnot. Yes. Uh, Tim, signs tell you where the exits are if you're up to your plan, your trip, and know where you're going. Yes, and, that, and exit numbers for sure are the biggest assistance in terms of defensive driving and whatnot because, as I said, if you're getting off at exit 40 and you know you're at exit 39, you need to get over... Uh, to the right and you need to be prepared to get off at that next exit. That is your biggest friend is knowing the mile markers on highways and uh, in the United States they're great. They're on all the state roads. Uh, they're on all of the interstates uh, here in Canada. They're on the Trans-Canada Highway and some of the other major highways and whatnot are the mile markers. Uh, the 401 in Canada and in Quebec on the 40 and the 20. All of these roads have mile markers and it is going to help you out. Uh, in Australia on the Hume Highway, uh, all the exits had mile markers. So when you do your route planning, figure out which mile marker you're going to get off at and that is going to help with your defensive driving, your advanced defensive driving skills. Okay, Ross, and when it comes to both rain and snow, I also turn uh, on the rear wiper because I drive an SUV, but I do not turn on the windshield wipers and my headlights. Uh, oh, you do. Okay, awesome. Yeah, the windshield wiper on the rear is just kind of keep the windshield clear back there. I don't know how well it works. Um, the, the wiper on the back of the buggy works, but in all the years that I've owned the buggy, I've never changed the windshield wiper on the back windshield. I've never used it. I know that the windshield wiper works back there. Uh, I know that the spray doesn't work though. I need to change the pump on the vehicle. Um, and I have one oddly enough, but I've never changed it. I've never really needed use for it because when it gets sludged over in the winter time with all that mud and crap on the highway and whatnot, I just use the wing mirrors. <laughs> so, and I wait until I go into the fuel station to get fuel and then I just clean it with the squeegee. So uh, maybe one day that might be a project I'll pull the car apart and actually fix that. Uh, 
Mallory, I was telling my mom this morning about what you called the dock at the ferry terminal uh, from how you get on a ferry video. Uh, yeah, the key. Uh, it's called the key. <laughs> the ferry key, uh, which is spelled Q-U-A-Y, key. And of course, I didn't learn that until I started taking the ferry back and forth from Vancouver Island uh, at Tawasin there. And there's another word to try and spell, Tawasin. It's like T-S-W-A-S-S-E-S-E-S-S-I-S. It's it's not an easy word. It's not like Mississippi, which is, you know, M-I-S-S-I-S-S-I-P-P-I, right? That's easy. That's easy. That's a cool song. Tawasin does not lend itself to an easy song. <laughs> Uh, Tim says, I use my rear wiper to keep the glass clean for my camera. Okay, so you have a front and a rear facing camera on your car. You have a, you have a fancy camera, Tim, on your car. Uh, Corey's put up the video there on oversteering on highways and freeways. And uh, somebody suggested to me the other day to do some more crash analysis of dash cam footage because I guess there's no shortage of dash cam footage uh, here on the internet. So... <laughs> uh, so yeah, maybe I'll start doing that again as well. Yes, there you go, Marion. M O U S C A, Mickey Mouse. M I C K E Y. M I C. Yeah, yeah. I was little, little bit before my time. I had to learn it afterwards. But you know, those sing songs about how to spell Mississippi because it was so cool to tell everybody that you knew how to spell Mississippi. Now, if you could spell Tawasin, then you're a hero for sure. Emily, how do you see out the back window if it's rainy or snowy though? Uh, you don't. <laughs> you just don't, uh, Emily. You uh, you don't. You use your side mirrors, and uh, it's it's not weird for me because I drove truck for so long. And when you drive truck, there is no back window. Okay, there's just mirrors on a big truck. Uh, there's a sleeper right there behind you. There's the bunk, right? So you look. You if you're looking behind you, you're looking at the bed in the bunk. So when the back window <laughs> is sludged over and you can't see out of it, it's, it doesn't really bother me. I just use the side mirrors on the car. And uh, the thing about the side mirrors is, you know, usually I have a, a white wet wipe in the car and I just roll the window down and I clean the mirror on the side of the car or I get my passenger to do it. There we go. Everybody has now correctly spelled Tawasin for me, which evades me in terms of being able to spell it. No, I, if I was going to spell Tawasin, I would have to look it up. There you go. So, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I've been helped out there. All right. Uh, yeah, so dash cams. We talked about dash cams. We talked about crashing. We talked about where most fatal crashes happen. Most fatal crashes happen on clear days, drive roads, moderate traffic, on two-lane highways in rural areas that's where you're going to get into a fatal crash okay single vehicle rollovers there's so many single vehicle crashes that are inexplicable to authorities and those of us who are crash analysis investigators so know that know that if you do get a dash cam there's good sides to it as tim pointed out that if you're in a parking lot and somebody drives into your car uh when the vehicle is sitting there the if the car is shocked the camera will turn on and it will record what happened so you'll have a recording of the incident the downside of dash cams and cameras and whatnot is is that sometimes they can be used against you in a court of law and tim was saying this before that if they wanted to use your dash cam footage for whatever that they would probably have to get a search warrant to use the footage on your dash cam my question on that and i have heard this and maybe tim you can clarify this for me they can go in and they can plug in to the computer on your car. So they can check how fast you were going. They can check if you braked, those types of things. So if they can plug into the computer on your car when they're doing post-crash investigation, what is the difference between plugging into the car and using the dash cam footage? Why do they need a search warrant for one and they don't need a search warrant for the other? Both are part and parcel of your car. I'm, I'm curious about that question. Emily, I actually saw a spray you can put on your side mirrors that repels water and keeps the glass dry and rainy and uh, wintry weather. Uh, anybody tried anything like this? Yes, uh, Rain-X, I'm sure, has a good product for that as well. And I've seen some life hack videos here on the channel as well that have that sort of similar thing. So there is some product around, Emily, that will do that for sure. Uh, Con, in the stop sign after you have stopped 
in three seconds do you have to give way after you or can you just go no if it's a two-way stop sign after you've come to a complete stop you have to give way to traffic on the crossroad you can't just go if it is a four-way stop then yes you can go if it is your turn to go at the intersection Corey's put up the stop sign intersection video for you that'll give you more details uh, Zachy, uh, if somebody is turning left in front of you on a busy road and stopping with slow traffic behind you, is it okay to pass on the right if no pedestrians? So somebody's turning, you're driving through, somebody turning left, passing. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay, so they're turning left in front of you. Uh, no, in many places there is a law, maybe Tim can tell me whether there's a law here in British Columbia, you cannot go off the pavement to pass somebody on the right. You, there has to be, uh, you have to stay on the pavement. You cannot drop off into the gravel. Okay. Um, Tim, yes, that was an interesting course. Warren is starting to be needed for that too. Awesome. Okay. So interesting. So you need a, a you're now beginning to need a search warrant to plug into the car, the computer on the car, and you're needing a search warrant for your dash cam. But that's not saying that personal injury lawyers, because the work that I do with personal injury lawyers is that they get that footage. Every time uh, that I have worked uh, uh, with the transit authorities being the defendant, they have the dash cam footage. They have all that footage off the bus, okay? Plus they have the security footage along the roadway and whatnot. So they, they don't have any problem getting that uh, search warrant or getting that warrant to seize that property for sure. Okay, uh, Tim is actually reading uh, reading stored data in the airbag module. Okay, yes, pass on the right off roadway. Yes, that's what he was asking. Uh, Con, I always use the markers when driving uh, charters here on the 401. Easier to know how much further I have to go and where the next escape route is or en route for my train. My Tim's run for a double double. <laughs> awesome. 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 So awesome live stream. Great information. Thank you so much for all your great questions and participating. Uh, if you had a test in the last week or so and passed that, congratulations. That is awesome. Awesome news. And if you got a test coming up in the next week or so, good luck on that. And remember, pick the best answer, not necessarily the right answer. Have a great night. Bye now.